here i welcome tarun chaplot tarun chaplot is an application engineer manager in app product apps group for wireless cncp model groups at silicon labs he has an industry experience of over 14 years in the field of embedded systems wi-fi and bluetooth design so with this i hand over to Ch tarun chaplot there are more than 50 billion iot devices in the world and a majority of them have some form of wireless connectivity many of them have more than one type of wireless interface and that's a kind of format that's going to be here in the future the device using bluetooth may need a wi-fi interface for ensuring operation using voice commands as an example you know voice commands for alexa based uh, control a wi-fi device may need a may need bluetooth for provisioning that is how to set up the wi-fi access point and name and passwords and so on many iot devices don't have a user interface or a keypad a thread device uh, which is actually a mesh network may need wi-fi for connecting to the external world from one of its nodes called a border router and so on emerging iot standards such as matter from the Connectivity Standards Alliance, define protocols for building interoperable, interoperable IoT systems that use a multitude of connectivity methods. So they have realized that IoT devices may always have multiple ways to connect wirelessly. So this tutorial describes how wireless coexistence is built into the silicon and how performance, power consumption and interoperability are addressed. It then provides a hands-on experience on how IoT devices can be built using multi-protocol wireless modules uh, and uh, IoT evaluation kits from Silicon Labs as an example. It covers uh, device hardware design, software applications on the device, and software on the cloud to complete the IoT solution. Well, I work at Silicon Labs, and at Silicon Labs, we believe that uh, we are the leader in IoT wireless. That's because we've got all wireless interfaces represented in our chips and modules. And they all apply uh, to the IoT market, whether it's uh, consumer applications, medical, smart energy, automotive, and a variety of areas. And it covers, and we cover a lot of different wireless standards like Bluetooth and Thread and Wi-Fi and Z-Wave and Wison and so on. So we cover the entire gamut of wireless requirements in the IoT. So it's based on all that perspective that uh, I'm going to present this tutorial today. A long time back, a lot of electronics was actually used for control systems. I mean, we put man on the moon using electronics, but no microprocessor. So control systems used sensors as input devices to take data in and then they process the data using filters, using some kind of data signal conditioning networks. And then if they had to take a decision, they would probably go into the digital domain and do a comparator or use op amps and other, other uh, amplifiers to achieve what they want. And they would, in, at the end of all of that, they would control an actuator, which is an output device. Like sensors can sense temperature, humidity, presence of somebody and so on. Actuators can turn on or turn off a motor, can increase or decrease volume and so on. So that was a closed loop, loop control system using electronics. After a while, people found that they could actually, uh, they, they, if they wanted to be flexible, it was very difficult with hardware. If they had to change uh, the reaction time, if they wanted to change the level at which, uh, for example, okay, water had to be stopped uh, from entering a tank, then they had to go and change the hardware. Not at all easy uh, and also error prone. So when microprocessors came along, uh, it was a very obvious choice that you can have a microprocessor and later on it became a microcontroller uh, in the device. And, uh, and if you want to make changes, you can do it in software or firmware as it's called when it's inside an MCU. So sensors sending data to an MCU, which does a lot of processing and that MCU controlling an actuator uh, became very, very common. And that was the field of embedded systems, which is still alive today. So embedded systems have uh, a mixture of hardware and software in them, and a microcontroller has a lot to do with how it functions. 
and when that becomes iot then they decided that taking data from one sensors or a local node and then taking decisions was not very efficient uh, you for the best decision you might want to sense data from multiple sensors in the area nearby or other information that comes in from the outside world and together make a much better decision much more intelligent decision and the only way to do that is to send the data out into some place where others can also send the data and all the data is collected in that common place and then the algorithm or the software runs and decides what to do and pushes back the control information to all the actuators which need to be controlled so this uh, central point of course became the cloud server because it is lying somewhere behind the cloud as is drawn in all of these uh, network diagrams okay nobody knows how it reaches the server it can go through one hop two hops five hops whatever nobody knows it can also change from time to time we all know that there is a server somewhere out there and it receives all the data from us uh, from multiple devices in our building and information coming from outside like what is the weather report what is the current uh, i mean the, the the state of electricity what is the uh, charges being charged right now and so on a lot of decisions that come from different places can all be taken to the cloud and then you take it you can take a better decision so as a structure of an iot device uh, all of these are, are 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 very are fundamental sensors mcus connectivity options and that's one of the focus areas of today's tutorial is on the connectivity or wireless connectivity to be more specific let's take an example let's say there are a couple of appliances in the home a washing machine and an air conditioner when they are both operating they don't operate like constantly in one power consumption mode whenever it gets too hot uh, the air conditioner's compressor turns on and then when it turns on the room gets cooled and then when it's cool enough the compressor turns off of course there are other ways of doing it now uh, in terms of increasing and decreasing the rate at which cooling takes place but the fundamental concept is that in a washing machine there is a sequence of operations that are carried out in terms of okay soaking washing rinsing some of these operations require the motor to be turned on some of them don't have the motor on so what happens if the compressor is also on and the motor is also on generally nothing happens it all works but the collective load instantaneous load increases and there are two problems with instantaneous load the first is that uh, the, the 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 entire wiring not only inside your house but in in the neighborhood has to be done for peak load not average load and they found that the peak to average ratio is very high in all our consumption so unnecessarily a lot of these circuits are being designed for a peak load that doesn't exist very often so they at the so the smart grid and all these smart appliances they are all trying to see how we can make the load more average and how do you make it more average is to have both of these devices talk to each other or talk to a local uh, node and then what they can get controlled in a way in which you can intersperse the peak activity of each device for example it's okay to soak the clothes a little bit longer while the compressor cools the room so this is an example and the other problem with the peak load is that okay there is a uh, uh, the the paucity of electricity or power uh, can aggravate some situations so in many countries there is a load based uh, charging for power uh, we have heard of examples that can also i mean become thousands of times more in disaster, disaster scenarios but whenever just like our ola and uber Uh, cabs whenever there is more load then the charges increase so as an intelligent consumer you might want to average out your load and save cost now this kind of averaging the load and saving the cost is done locally just by averaging out but what if you want to look at the load in the entire neighborhood you really want to run your washing machine little more more intelligently let it run all night but in the morning it should be done but let it pick up when a pick up its uh, current 
whenever uh, there is less load in the neighborhood and the power charges are instantaneously lower than before. So that instantaneous, instantaneous decision requires information coming in real time from the, the, the transmission authorities uh, and it can be done if uh, the, the information goes out to a cloud and in that cloud server you also subscribe to get notifications from the electricity department and then you can take a much better decision remotely. So you can have local intelligence or you can have remote intelligence. All this is IoT and all this is enabled uh, through connectivity. Let's take, a, take another example uh, this time of a medical IoT application. This is in fact the kind of golden standard in medical IoT is to have remote monitoring of patients and also remote intervention to take care of situations. You know, I mean, we have uh, many cases where uh, it's not always possible for a patient to rush to a hospital uh, in quick time, especially those who are at high risk uh, 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 situations. They might want to have some kind of a monitoring uh, being done all the time. So many things can be monitored. We have glucometers, we have the pulse oximeter, we have different implantables, we have a blood pressure monitor and so on. So all of them collect data. They need to transmit that data. Somebody somewhere needs to evaluate that and it needs to notify some other device which can then intervene. For example, intervention is to pump more insulin into the blood. So this entire cycle can be automated to some extent. Uh, many of these things are quite standard and well known. Uh, evaluation stage is where sometimes a doctor can have a look at it and see whether there's something else that he should do. But all of this is possible today, all of this is happening today and all of this is happening because of small devices which actually operate at very low power consumption but have the, connect, have the ability to connect and send data and receive data from the external world. This is a clear uh, a benefit of IoT in the medical world. We've been harping on connectivity and you know there's always been a lot of ways to connect. We've uh, had the wired world rule electronics for a long time. Even now wired connections are imperative. Uh, serial connections RS-232, RS-485 will never go away. In the industrial domain we have different kinds of buses which define physical layer and the data which formats that flow on it, Modbus, Canvas, Profibus, so many are there. We ourselves are much more familiar with of course Ethernet and USB. Uh, USB very important because it's, a, uh, it's very close to the devices that we are using and Ethernet in campus networks and office networks although it's moving to wireless because of all the advances in Wi-Fi, but uh, Ethernet is still the backbone. You can't do without it. There are many more options in wireless. Bluetooth, Bluetooth low energy, Zigbee, Wi-Fi. Sometimes, okay, there's a confusion between is it wireless LAN or Wi-Fi? Well, it's always been wireless LAN, but uh, because the wireless LAN standard is based on the 802.11, IEEE 802.11 standard, which is a very voluminous document, which uh, a lot of people don't actually uh, understand very well. The early wireless LAN devices were not very interoperable. So an industry alliance called the Wi-Fi Alliance came into being and they decided to set up uh, interoperability tests. And then they also wanted to make it a kind of a brand name. So they started calling it Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi and wireless LAN are pretty much synonymous, but Wi-Fi is a brand name which we are all more fam familiar with. Then you have the cellular networks, 4G, 5G, 6G we are going to talk about quite a lot in the coming years, um, LoRa, Z-Wave, Wison, Ant Plus, Proprietary and so on, too many of them. So why are there so many wireless standards? There are many reasons for this. The frequency which a wireless I mean, protocol uses is based on what is allocated to it. Uh, uh, all the operators in the 3G, 4G, 5G I mean the carriers, they have paid lots and lots of money to get a few megahertz of uh, uh, bandwidth at certain frequency bands. So when they paid so much money for bandwidth, they want their protocol to be very spectrally efficient. 
so the actual method of transmission reception modulation demodulation all of them are different some of these uh, protocols i mean are used in scenarios where the wireless band is free for all like wi-fi and bluetooth so there you need a medium access method that allows uh, the capability to operate in when lots of people are trying to operate at the same time cellular uh, frequencies or military frequencies people know who is going to transmit so there can be regulation and there can be a time based allocation of spectrum and so on so the methods change so they are need a different type of wireless protocol and there can be performance and use cases like what kind of data rates are needed what's the range of operation is it a few centimeters is it several hundred kilometers uh, do we need mobility do we need the ability to operate when you're moving at say 500 kilometers an hour and still be able to roam uh, what kind of network topology is it it's a mesh network is it a star network all of these uh, make for different types of wireless uh, protocols then you have application requirements like the power consumption of a device uh, so you need to have some very power efficient ways of communicating the ability to be able to turn off and turn on without losing connectivity to the network then quality of service i mean you know in wireless world you can never guarantee that the receiver gets your data never uh, it always becomes a kind of a probabilistic thing so quality of service is built into wireless networks through multiple ways and all of these ways uh, are defined in the protocol then you might have security requirements then there could be safety environmental conditions and personal safety personal safety are you is the iot device going to be held very close to somebody's head in that case the transmit power may need to be restricted so you can see that one size does not fit all we do need multiple wireless standards in the iot now iot devices also have have some special requirements uh, which also are done or provided through wireless means one of them is uh, provisioning wi-fi devices need to be configured to connect to the network uh, you know cellular devices use a sim card which has all the information wi-fi devices don't have a sim card so the device the access point to connect to or the password needs to be fed into it and most iot devices don't have a keypad and even some of them don't even have a display so there has to be some other way of doing it then uh, because we have so many devices on the network and you don't have a sim card how do you know that you are who you purport to be uh, i'm talking about the iot device here so the device identity being securely known to others is also a special requirement in the iot security is very important i mean you don't want your iot device to be um, getting information for, for meant for somebody else erroneously or even uh, i mean deliberately uh, you want your data to be known only to you because data you know is very expensive and data can be a key to building successful systems so security is extra important you also need i mean no one ever i mean wrote firmware uh, right the first time so devices go out into the field and they need upgrades hardly any device there which doesn't need an upgrade Uh, so that upgrade needs to be provided over the air because there are no connectors there are no ways in which that update can be given to the device then the devices need to be configurable because they need to be operating in different scenarios and the users may need some uh, special uh, features or settings from them so you need to be have you need to have them to be wirelessly configurable so many iot devices are battery operated so battery life is very important so the wireless method should not be profligate in consuming power it should be there should be ways in which uh, the power consumption can be reduced at least the energy consumption can be reduced unfortunately i mean just like wireless protocols are many wired or network protocols are also many udp tcp http https mqtt coap so many of them exist and we cannot really converge on any one protocol so devices may need to implement many of these inside and some of them also require cloud agents because i mean although matter and other things are coming uh, before that there was uh, different types of uh, networks and different types of solutions all of which needed data in different formats so many iot devices had required to have cloud agents running on them which can connect to different uh, cloud providers or iot service providers so 
you can see that all of these also need to be built into the IoT device. Let's look a little bit more again into the spectrum. You know, the radio frequencies, I mean, span a very wide part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, IoT devices actually, I mean, they, their range is a little bit short, range of operation. I mean, they need only to connect to the nearest wired node. Uh, in many cases, they need to connect to our other maybe wireless device, which is maybe only a few centimeters away. Uh, range is small, but most of these, okay, because the devices are also small, uh, you know, antenna size is uh, proportional to the frequency of operation. So you cannot have, I mean, lower frequencies like LF, MF, HF, some of them use, I mean, antennas like, you know, telescopic antennas and so on. IoT devices can't afford that. So most of the IoT operations, okay, I mean, are in the 700 megahertz to 6 gigahertz area. Now, unfortunately, pretty much all of these uh, bands and frequencies are allocated for something or the other. There's nothing free. All the land is occupied. Uh, so what was the solution? There was a path breaking decision taken around the world that actually changed the future of wireless networking. And that momentous event was the definition of the license free ISM bands, industrial, scientific and medical bands in the 900 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz. And we also have other frequencies below 900 megahertz now where countries can allocate and even 60 gigahertz and so on. So these are some typical, um, these are the three typical bands used in most wireless networking uh, applications. And what license free means is that you don't have to purchase the spectrum. So you can go ahead and use it provided you follow a lot of rules which are specified. Some of those rules or many of those rules are meant to be good neighbors. That means that you, uh, if we take an example of, uh, of, of cricket being played in a stadium, that's a controlled environment. You, you, have, you can follow all the cricketing rules. Then you have the license free local ground or maidan where you know 5, 10, 15, 20 teams play on Saturdays or Sundays and they need different rules. They can't play with a hard ball. They can't place a fielder in the middle of somebody else's pitch. So the environment for a free for all and the rules for a free for all are different. If you follow all of the rules, you can use these frequencies for free. Now let's look a little bit at the range of operation of wireless networks. Well, we may ask why is there a limit on range? Obviously, I mean, if you, if, if you can transmit an infinite distance, you won't have so many problems. But of course, wireless networks are like any other network where you have connectivity, I mean, everything has um, a path loss, everything fades over distance. In the wireless world, this is called a link budget. A link budget is based on the fact that a receiver, you know that in wireless systems, the receivers do not actually uh, figure out or do not actually know what was transmitted. They only make a guess. They make increasingly good guesses. The guesses are even better if the received signal to noise ratio is higher and below a certain signal to noise ratio their guesses become wavered more than 10 percent wrong and some of them can be retrieved through error correction mechanisms but so at a, at a certain snr and below i mean it's not generally i mean feasible to receive something the way you want and that point of snr where you can where you, where, you, where you determine that you can't operate below that is called the receiver sensitivity and if if uh, signals have to reach the receiver with that kind of a signal strength um, i mean what comes in its way firstly that when signals are transmitted you have a transmit power in the power amplifier and uh, then you connect it to an antenna there could be a cable loss or it could be a trace loss there could be some losses and the antenna can have a gain you know if you're pointing it in one direction it can actually concentrate the energy in that direction so the antennas can have a gain so that adds to the uh, link budget then through free space you have path losses so if you're not in free space you have obstructions like uh, i mean walls and partitions you'll have more losses so what you receive at the receive antenna is signals with uh, a much much less than what was transmitted 
and the receiver also may have an antenna which is pointing in the right direction so you might have an antenna gain and then again you have some cable losses and after that the receiver gets signals from which okay, it can determine uh, what was it can try to guess what was transmitted uh, at uh, uh, provided the SNR is good enough. So you can imagine from here that you can increase your range if you trans if you increase your power transmitted if you increase your antenna gain or you are closer to the transmitter that means the transmitter and receiver are much closer to each other then the radio path losses will be less so that is directly a, a, a measure of the range of operation unfortunately wireless networks in the iot may need to operate at different ranges so what if the particular range is not i mean is too long so wireless LAN, for example, addresses this problem by defining more than one modulation mechanism. It can be BPSK giving 6 or 9 Mbps for the 802.11G example, or uh, QPSK giving you 12 Mbps or 18 Mbps, all the way to 64 QAM, which gives you 48 or 54 Mbps. And you know that we have 256 QAM and 1024 QAM also coming also there in uh, more recent wireless LAN standards. Now what happens is that uh, the, 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 the shorter the distance, the better the SNR, the, the more complex the modulation scheme that you can use. So if you have a good SNR, then you can use a complex modulation scheme and get more data rate. If your SNR is less, the transmission automatically drops back to a smaller rate. This is called an automatic rate fallback mechanism. So if, if a transmitter finds that it's not able to get through, at say I mean 54 Mbps it can probably come back and try at 24 Mbps and maybe go back and try at 6 Mbps also. So this rate fallback mechanism is based upon heuristics of what kind of packets were acknowledged properly or not but wireless LAN provides different modulation schemes so that if you are far away at least you can get low data rates reliably. Now why is it that higher and more complex modulation schemes have a shorter range? Uh, it's because when you have lesser signal to noise ratio when there is relatively more noise then the signal points on the constellation which you can see uh, phase and amplitude variations the noise can take it into the domain of the next modulation point so it's very easy to become uh, I mean erroneous in, in your in the receivers uh, uh, demodulation of what was transmitted what it guesses that it was transmitted so more complex modulation schemes are more uh, prone to being degraded by noise and that's when you have to shift to lower modulation schemes where the relative distance between uh, uh, between points on the constellation is much higher and this brings us to something called rate versus range so the longer the range the short the less the data rate that can be supported and this is true of many communication systems. Wireless LAN or Wi-Fi is probably the one which has the maximum number of data rates because the network is a little bit unregulated. The distances are not very planned properly. I mean, if you have an office, you put in Wi-Fi router somewhere and you expect every workstation everywhere to, to be able to receive some kind of signal. So it cannot actually do a lot of planning. So wireless LAN, okay, right from the beginning, define lots of data rates and cover the rate versus range curve in a fairly smooth way. So if you were to choose between different protocols, uh, you can see that the uh, protocol with the smallest range and the smallest data rate uh, is uh, near field communication or NF RFID. So some of it is as limited to just a few centimeters like you take your access card near your reader and then a door opens for you. Uh, so NFC or RFID is very low data rate and very low range. Uh, Zigbee had low data rate 250 kilobits per second, but it could go a few tens of meters. Uh, Bluetooth low energy and Ant Plus are very widely used in, in, in fitness devices. They give one or two Mbps of uh, data rate and they also can go up to 1020 meters. Uh, Z-Wave uh, gives even lower data rate can, but can go much longer, 100 meters or so. Uh, then we have okay Wi-Fi, which is evolving. I mean, rapidly and, and and several gigabits per second it can support already. 
and it can go to hundreds of meters also. So there's a lot of work going on in Wi-Fi to make it more universal. So you can see the coverage here is quite a lot and that can be so Wi-Fi can often be called as the most universal type of connectivity in the IoT. Uh, 3G, 4G, 5G and so on, all of them also are very versatile but they are licensed spectrum and devices need to be uh, charged if they are to use that network. Mm. Uh, so that's a uh, that's an impediment uh, for adoption. Wi-Fi of course, I um, mean this is free, the, the spec frequency band is free. Wi-Fi also has a variant called sub gigahertz Wi-Fi. Uh, which is also uh, used for backhaul connectivity, longer ranges than this. Uh, more uh, common than Wi-Fi in the sub gigahertz is now Wi-Sun, uh, which provides again for uh, hundreds of meters at a few uh, megabits per second and used for smart cities uh, predominantly. And since we're talking about Wi-Fi, uh, let's talk about what's out there today, the most advanced Wi-Fi standard, the 802.11ax. Uh, dubbed the Wi-Fi 6 standard by the Wi-Fi Lens. Uh, it, it came to being as uh, a high efficiency wireless LAN method. So they wanted to improve spectral efficiency and area throughput. That means for a given area, can they provide more bits per second per user than earlier? So more density of network, of, of, of the network, more nodes in a particular area, and uh, more overall throughput needed all went into the creation of the 802.11ax standard. Um, so you also needed uh, uh, better support for uh, uh, energy efficient devices. There is battery operated devices. Uh, so you, can you really make sure that the battery doesn't drain because everybody is there contending for the medium at the same time and you're waiting for your chance, you're waiting for your chance. Is there a way in which the devices can be made uh, more deterministic in their access to the network so that they can go back to sleep faster. This has all been addressed in uh, Wi-Fi 6 and they've all been implemented through the use of OFDMA where the band uh, the bandwidth has been split uh, so that different subcarriers go to different uh, nodes and therefore you can more efficiently use the network. You also have multi-user MIMO in downlink and uplink which means that multiple antenna systems in the access point um, you can actually split the signals so that uh, each client node can get maybe one antenna worth of information. Okay, so very uh, important and far reaching developments have taken place here. Target wake time or TWT is, is how IoT devices need not stay awake and wait and wait for their chance to transmit or receive. So they can be more deterministic uh, through TWT. Then it has some more advanced beamforming and a much higher modulation scheme like 1024 QAM. Uh, so all of this make Wi-Fi 6 the next generation IoT connectivity standard and it's going to catch on okay, very, very uh, rapidly now. We spoke about network topology. Uh, I spoke about uh, star mesh network and there's also something called peer-to-peer -peer network like Bluetooth, uh, just two devices and nothing else. Now star networks are ideal for a planned wireless environment where you know where your central node is going to be so that your coverage is uh, well defined. So Wi-Fi and the cellular 3G, 4G, 5G are all examples of star networks. And then in the home and in the uh, industry environment, if you cannot do a lot of detailed planning, uh, then you can use a mesh network where you just throw devices around and they all find each other, they all find a way in which they can send data out to an edge node which will then transfer data to the outside world. Zigbee, Z-Wave, Thread, these are all examples of, uh, of, of, of mesh networks. Let's look at a few of the various types of uh, network options or wireless options in a little bit more detail. The most, uh, I mean, recent Bluetooth standard is Bluetooth 5, uh, which apart from doing uh, voice connectivity, which is how Bluetooth started, uh, it also does data connectivity very well. It absorbs the Bluetooth low energy uh, definitions into it and it can actually make it so efficient that a single uh, coin cell battery can last for 10 years or more in a Bluetooth low energy device or a Bluetooth 5 device. 
okay so i mean they also have a longer range and can transmit okay more data so bluetooth 5 addresses a lot more environments and this is very very popular it's there and of course in every smartphone and then you have it in a lot of uh, fitness devices different sensors bluetooth tags that you can use to determine the location of uh, objects and so on uh, zigbee has been around for a while very popular in the us and very much ubiquitous in the home environment it uses 2.4 gigahertz the d i mean direct sequence spectrum method uh, i mean reasonable range 1020 meters a few 100 kilobits per second of data rate very common in uh, home automation remote control and healthcare it's also based on an ieee standard 82.15.4 and it uses the mesh topology one of the most uh, prominent examples of a mesh network is a zigbee networks it actually defines uh, not only the wireless protocol but it defines everything all the way to the application layer so zigbee applications are well defined so everything is defined all the way to the application it's different from wifi where what application you you are using it for okay the network doesn't know it's like a uh, ethernet or wireless lan you can use i mean uh, you can use it for instagram or facebook or whatever any number of applications can run on the underlying ip protocol which wifi provides whereas with zigbee uh, the zigbee uh, or the connectivity standards alliance defines all the the entire network all the way up to the application layer zwave is an alternative to zigbee in the sub gigahertz band uh, unlike 2.4 sub gigahertz that is 800 900 megahertz they actually go longer distances and they are also that they, therefore they are also more power efficient so in a home they found out that uh sometimes okay i mean you don't get connectivity if you have a fairly large home which is quite common in the us you have a sensor at your end of your driveway you have a water meter somewhere in a corner of your garden we have some uh, uh i mean intrusion detection system somewhere all of them had difficulty in getting connected to the home network but z wave helps uh, i mean do i mean do all of that because of its sub gigahertz a nature uh, uh, the frequency that it supports and uh, applications of this include uh, uh, smart home uh, smart offices and also in uh, commercial establishments like hotels and ships now outdoor wifi iot is uh, is actually i mean uh, 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 dominated by either the 3g 4g connectivity or increasingly by lora or the lora is not very ideal but it's cheap and a lot of students do projects using lora uh, you can go a few hundred meters so you can keep a kind of a lora base station on top of your building and all around a campus you can get connectivity for iot devices through lora it's a privately defined uh, protocol um, uh, it's a small size okay cheap and you can actually send a few tens of kilobits per second over several hundred meters uh quite easily so it's an example of what is called as a low power wide area network which is not a local area but a wide area over a few square kilometers of operation the fact that iot and iot devices will will exist in the billions uh was writing on the wall for quite some time and you know where devices need connectivity who provides the connectivity and there's always been a been competition amongst different standards uh, wifi is, is trading on uh, cellular zig uh, bluetooth is trying to trade on wifi uh, the home network environment you you can have wifi you can have thread you can have z wave so many standards compete and in this domain the 5g standard actually defines something for iot as well they discovered or that they realized that uh, soon there's going to be hundreds of thousands of connections per cell rather than the few hundreds or at the most a few thousands for example if you're in a stadium you might have a thousand people connected to the same tower if your iot devices it can be lakhs so that is something that they wanted to do uh, wanted to cover then some of the devices were deep underground uh, so you need to have a good link budget link margin so that you can go underground uh it also needs to uh, cover devices which have low i mean i mean which which whose battery cannot be changed once you do it and put it there for 10 years it has to operate 
and then you take it out and replace it. So you need to support 10 year battery life and low cost and easy integration with other systems. And the narrow band IoT is promising to do all of this. So it's coming up. So watch the space and let's see how it uh, pans out. Wisun is a sub gigahertz uh, network which is primarily meant for smart grid. Uh, it was uh, for smart utilities, but later on they decided that it can be used for lots of purposes. So they called it a wireless smart ubiquitous network. And again, this is not in the in the ISM bands, but India has allocated frequencies for this. So it can be used in India uh, and it's being used in India primarily for smart cities. So Wisen has a range of several uh, kilometers. It's a mesh network and the border router is what connects to the external world and it has uh, uh, components called the home area networking component which is primarily inside the home and a field area network component which is uh, across buildings in a campus in the complete city and uh, watch the space because Wisen is catching on really fast. Now a slight digression on 5G. Uh, we spoke about the fact that 5G has defined a narrowband IoT method where, I mean, lakhs of devices can actually be connected and so on. Uh, in addition, it also has something called ultra reliable, low latency communication. Uh, they call it mission critical 5G. You know, uh, this is something similar in, in an application to IoT applications. Uh, for example, for industrial controls, uh, or you have an industrial robot, which is uh, doing something. If it senses something, it has to take action immediately within a millisecond or a few milliseconds. It can also be used for autonomous vehicles where uh, based on the scenario, the vehicles can stop, turn, move or whatever, again with very low latency and very high reliability. So a lot of applications like industrial control, autonomous vehicles, I mean drones and robots will all use this aspect of 5G. But the aspect of 5G that we will be most familiar with is very high speed I mean, 20 Gbps, I mean, generic internet, video on demand, augmented reality, I mean, everything that we are used to in our cell phone will all come from this part of 5G. But the protocol of choice is more and more Wi-Fi. And Wi-Fi is not a single standard. It started with something that's been evolving and evolving and rightly, you know, has uh, run out of... Uh, of numbers, so they have gone to two digits, and just like our uh, our vehicle numbers, uh, for example, 11VE is uh, coming up as this as the next generation of Wi-Fi. So lots and lots of changes. This keeps changing, and this keeps getting applicable to many different uh, scenarios. So Wi-Fi will always be there. Wi-Fi is still the most ubiquitous uh, method of communication for uh, IoT devices. Uh, two. To delve a little bit more about what Wi-Fi has been doing, starting with 11 Mbps in 802.11b and all the way up to 9 Gbps or more in 11ax, they have uh, kept changing the modulation mechanism, the, the, the bandwidth of operation, the number of subcarriers in the OFDM method, the kind of forward error correction they are using, the, 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 the length of the symbols they are using, uh, how many subcarriers, what is the subcarrier spacing, what is the modulation method um, and so on and also one antenna or multiple antennas and multi-user MIMO a lot of things have been evolving so that we can get more capacity and uh, better quality of service as we go along. Right at the start we mentioned that IoT devices may need more than one uh, connectivity protocol built in. So let's look at an example of uh, why this is to be. Let's take a smart lock. Smart locks are very common now and are going to be increasingly common. Uh, most homes will have a smart lock sometime in the future. A uh, smart lock operates okay, wirelessly. I mean, it, you can actually open it uh, through feeding a code. You can open it by opening an app on your phone. Some smart locks have a video camera that can recognize your face and open it. Uh, many different, uh, you can, some of them use biometrics, um, but yeah, let's take the example of a smart lock. I mean, that, uh, I mean, almost all smart locks uh, allow connection to a cell phone. So they connect to your cell phone and receive a code or authorization uh, through Bluetooth, uh, BT5. 
and sometimes it is not local sometimes okay a temporary code might have been given to you by so let's say that you are you are visiting your friend's place and friend isn't home yet your friend can send you a code on uh, so that you can enter the code now this code is sent to the cloud server through a secure wi-fi connection and uh, then the cloud server comes back and tells the lock yes this is a valid code you can open it so it needs bluetooth it needs wi-fi also and uh, if it's connected in the home what if there's a uh, fire alarm and uh, that fire alarm transmits information on zigbee for example maybe okay then the door should automatically open so that people coming to the rescue people in the home can walk into the house so if such is such a thing is required you may also need zigbee but bluetooth and wi-fi are very common and the smart lock is a very common example of a home iot device let us look at another example of a smartwatch connected to the Wi-Fi network and pulls music files from the server. The headphones are connected to the smartwatch over a Bluetooth A2TP link and plays the same music. A speedometer connected over BLE sends notification to the smartwatch. The smartwatch sends these notifications over BLE to the mobile phone. So we have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth Classic, and Bluetooth Low Energy coexisting and performing different activities simultaneously in a smartwatch. There are different approaches to implement the multi-protocol in the IoT world. One of them is using multiple chips or the separate chips for each individual protocol. It can be one for Wi-Fi, another for Bluetooth or Zigbee or Z-Wave. But they can also be in the same frequency band and may require PTA, which is packet traffic arbitration, because they cannot transfer simultaneously if they are operating in the same frequency. While the other way is to use the single chip where the multiple protocols are handled with the software layer. So the same hardware supports multiple protocols while we use different techniques to handle the coexistence. We use dynamic switching between the protocols. Let's take the example of one of our implementation, the RS906 COEX algorithm, which is referred as COEX manager. It is implemented in the firmware. It is design, designed to decide and allocate the radio resources to the appropriate protocol. The COEX manager is implemented in two ways. One is time division method. In this method, each protocol is assigned a time slot to use the radio resources. Another method is on-demand radio method. In this, each protocol informs the COEX manager the time for which it will require the radio. These methods are implemented in different states for each protocol. For example, in case of WLAN, TDM is implemented in active and continuous data transfer states. ODM is implemented in deep sleep and connected standby power save states. In the same way, implementation of BT Classic and BLE states is done as mentioned here. Let us take an example on how the radio is shared between WLAN and BLE. Here, WLAN station is connected to an access point and doing the continuous data transfer. Assume the radio is with WLAN. Now, BLE received an advertising command from the host with an advertising interval of 200 milliseconds. BLE protocol sets activity request to COEX manager to process that advertising command. COEX manager requests WLAN for the radio resources by sending a pause protocol request. WLAN finishes ongoing data transfer in order to maintain the connection with AP 
WLAN protocol informs the AP that it is going to sleep state. Now WLAN hands over the radio to coax manager and sends a pause hack. To allocate the radio resources to BLE, COEX manager sends resume protocol request. Upon receiving the radio, BLE protocol sends resume ACK to COEX manager. BLE does any necessary actions once the radio is allocated. BLE finished its radio activity and sends a sleep request along with the sleep duration of 200 milliseconds as this is the BLE advertising interval and hands over the radio to COEX manager. Right now, the radio is with COEX manager. To allocate the radio resources back to WLAN, the COEX manager sends resume protocol request to WLAN. WLAN protocol receives the radio and sends resume ACK to COEX manager. WLAN continues the data transfer until it gets the pause protocol. This is a brief overview of COEX manager in RS-906. So far we have looked at theoretical part for the IoT. Now let's look at this from a developer point of view. There are various tools and devices available in the market for building a multi-protocol IoT device. We will also see a demo which can be the base for any IoT device whether it is a smart home or industrial or medical application. What would an ideal IoT platform look like? Well, it will have hardware, software, wireless radios and security. Altogether, a compact IoT development platform which helps developing IoT products. Integrated hardware and software platform and intuitive development tools make the developer life easy and any company can create wirelessly connected devices for any industrial, commercial, home, health or safety application. If you get right tools, time to market also reduces. For any developer, the first component that they need to look for is the MCU. In general, any application that requires computations that involve large numbers and that must be calculated faster should use a 16-bit or 32-bit microcontroller. Some example operations include FFT calculations, image processing, high quality audio or video, and edge computing applications. To choose the best microcontroller for your PCB design, while minimizing time and overall cost, it is necessary to carefully assess the key advantages and disadvantages of 8-bit versus 32-bit MCU by taking design requirements like speed, complexity, peripherals and flash memory into consideration. What are the various features of MCU that a developer should look for? Feature rich and highly integrated. This makes your design simplified and reduces cost with highly integrated 32-bit MCUs and RF SOCs and modules. MCU should have high performance and low power peripherals like ADCs, DACs, timers, capacitive touch and communication options like I2C, USB and Ethernet. Having rich features will reduce design complexity and bill of materials. For better understanding, let's compare with the real time example. Consider a laptop with only single USB port. How inconvenient would that be? No charging port, multiple USB ports or earphone jack. Now to charge we need an external connector, one side with USB and other side with C port or any charging port. Then to connect earphones, 
again we need an external connector. This will be very inconvenient to use and creates more work. Similarly for an MCU, it should have many inbuilt features and should be highly integrated. Productivity design tools. MCU optimizes designs with application configuration, energy profiling, advanced debug and network analysis tools. Therefore, it is important for an MCU to take advantage of various analysis tools. In IoT world, there are n number of nodes and it has to be secure from end node to cloud. Otherwise, the whole setup is compromised. Please note that these IoT devices are used in medical and industrial environments where there is sensitive data flowing. So it must support latest SSL and TLS network for the data transmission. Why is hardware security important? Hardware security protects the machine and peripheral hardware from theft and from electronic intrusion and damage. Then what is software security? Software security is an idea implemented to protect software against malicious attack and other hacker risk so that the software continues to function correctly under such potential risk. Majority of the IoT devices are battery operated, so low power is the key. Here we talk in terms of microamp consumption. So every part of code optimization or the hardware optimization is the key in IoT world. To accelerate the evaluation and development of secure applications, embedded software is needed for MCU. What are they? When embedded developers obtain a board or a chip, it's typically tied to a board support package, PSP, or software development kit, SDK. The main difference is that a BSP targets hardware and usually a specific board or family of boards, while an SDK can target hardware or software. For an SDK, in terms of software, the target may be an API, middleware or an operating system. Of course, middleware and operating system can have many APIs for different functional areas. An SDK that targets hardware often includes a support or supports one or more BSPs. To make this feature easier to understand, let us use the example of a C program. Consider a C program to add two numbers with logic as A plus B, where the value of A and B are defined in the code. Now consider the logic A plus B where user enters input for A and B values after execution of code, which is flexible, obviously the second code. In the same way, MCU should maintain design flexibility with pin compatible option that scale memory, peripherals and connectivity to match your needs. Multi-protocol connectivity. To discuss about connectivity, first we need to know about protocols. What are the common wireless protocols we hear in our day-to-day -day life? Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, Thread, etc. We should see the ability of the design to serve multiple regions and field upgrades to meet the evolving market needs. Let's take one of the IoT development platform example, the EFR Wireless Starter Kit. This kit provides high performance 32-bit MCU and radio boards for Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, Thread, and multi-protocol software stacks. Along with this kit, you would need an ID which provides one-click access to design tools, documentation, software, and support resources for wireless modules and SOCs. Get up and running quickly with pre-compiled demos, application notes, and examples. In general, if you have a look, uh, most of the starter kits or the development boards, they will have an LCD, 
the Ethernet port, <coughs> a USB to serial port which connects to the PC to provide the power to the board or this can also be used to get the serial print on the console in the ID. A battery holder to check for low power applications using a coin cell battery. Power source selector switch to select either from battery or from the USB power. Ultra low power LCD options. Buttons and LEDs. Some kits will also have a headers where serial port or packet trace options will be there. And also there will be option for any mo energy monitoring. For the debug and the trace. Most of the boards are used having ARM processor, so they also provide ARM core site 19 pin header. Here it's the connection to connect to the AA battery holder. In case some of the applications which we may want to check with a AA battery. This expansion header board is to connect more expansion boards which may have different module on it. Most of the boards comes with the accelerometer, gyrometer or different sensors. For example, here SI7021, which is a humidity and temperature sensor. Then here there is an option for a daughter board, which has a radio module on it. So you can change different radio boards and can put different radio modules based on the need that uh, the wireless protocol we are looking for. We are now going to see how we can create an IoT application with software on an AWS server. So AWS provides a lot of options to create MQTT or SSL servers or uh, uh, S3 server. And we'll do the provisioning or the commissioning, Wi-Fi commissioning using BLE. <coughs> and we'll use EFR32 as a microcontroller here. All we need is a PC or laptop where we'll use a IDE. For example, here we are using Simplicity Studio development tool, which will provide the compiler debugger and we'll have one EFR32 kit along with RS906 Wise Connect EVK, which is the radio uh, board here. We may also need a set of cables, for example, to make SPI connection or micro USB to power up the EVK board and some jumper wires in case we connect some GPIOs to put the module in power save an access point with the internet connectivity to connect to the cloud, an Android or iOS mobile with the app for the provisioning. Here we can see the hardware components of the IoT solution. So what all we need is a MCU. So here EFR32 G21 is the MCU, which is in wireless SOC, so which has MCU plus Wi Fi radio solution, which has the option to connect the antenna and it already has a PCB antenna on the board. There is an expansion header which has various GPIOs options available. There are some GPIOs also connected to the LEDs and the buttons which are there on the board. There is a red and green LED connected through GPIO and temperature and humidity sensor connected using I2C. The 
the LCD is connected to and communicating via SPI protocol. Let's have a look at the software components for any IoT solution. There will be a cloud, for example, AWS, Azure, Alibaba cloud. So there are some popular cloud solutions easily available, which provides MQTT or various things creation option when you have your account on one of these clouds. So the complete data that is uh, being sent from the device to the cloud is stored here and the user can take action either on the cloud it can be decided or at the edge node that action can be decided. Then there will be a Wi-Fi driver. This will be running on the MCU, which helps in uh, uh, providing the connectivity to the cloud via access point. Then if we talk about the stack, the TCP IP stack or the Bluetooth stack. So these stacks are uh, residing on the radio module. So the TCP IP stack will provide the TCP, UDP or MQTT uh, connections to the remote server while Bluetooth stack will provide the option to connect the BLE or the Bluetooth devices. For example, an IoT device connecting to a mobile phone. Then we will need some development tool. For example, the Simplicity Studio here, which is the IDE. So these are all the software parts. Multi-protocol IoT setup. As you can see, we have a laptop running the Simplicity Studio, which connects to the EFR32 development kit using a USB cable. This kit has the radio port as well as option to connect expansion header. Here is the RS-906 expansion board which is having a Wi-Fi plus BLE module on it with an antenna Here we have an EFR Connect app on iOS or Android. This is a demo app to try various demos that are available. One of them is Wi-Fi commissioning. Using BLE, we'll provision this RS-906 EXP which is configured in coex mode concurrent mode where Wi-Fi plus BLE both are available. Once provisioned using BLE, the module will go and connect to an access point and from there it will make the connectivity to the AWS cloud. We would have to load some certificates so that the communication is secure from end to end. We'll also be running an uh, Node.js uh, application to communicate to the cloud. So the communication will be between this laptop which is connected to the cloud to the board. So imagine there is a sensor which is a temperature sensor. That information goes from the device to the cloud and from cloud any user see can, that, that can see that information. Based on that information, a user can take any action and that can be sent to the device. 
we'll use MQTT because that's low power and lightweight. Let's have a quick look at the application code flow. When we start the program, it does device and driver initialization to configure the memory and the interfaces. Here, we'll be using SPI interface. Once the hardware part is done, there will be wireless configurations and certificates will be loaded. Once the certificates are loaded to the module memory, it will use those certificates to communicate to the cloud. After that, we'll start the BLE. So the BLE start advertising. Once the BLE advertisement starts, we connect to the mobile using Bluetooth. And then app takes the data of the APs list, which, which is scanned by the Wi-Fi part of the module. So once the AP list is available, it is sent to the mobile app. And in the mobile app, we select the desired AP to which we want to connect. And we enter the password. Once the SSID and the password is available, it is sent to the module and modules uses the Wi-Fi to connect to the AP and fetches the IP address over DHCP. After getting the IP address, it resolves DNS and connects to the AWS cloud and makes a secure connection. While connecting, it uses SSL and TLS features. After that, we do the MQTT in it. Here, there is a subscribe and publish. Two topics are used. This is to read and post data to AWS cloud from the device. If we look at the project, there are various files and folders available, which includes the spy driver or UART driver in case when we use UART interface. Here we are using spy interface. Here you can see the main file and some files which has configuration for BLE and WLAN. In the WLAN app.c, we'll be setting up the MQTT topics for subscribe and publish. Once our application is ready, we'll build or compile the code and then we'll flash the copy of the code onto the MCU. Once it is ready, we can run the application now anytime. I'll show you this in our next slide or the video. When we are developing any IoT applications, we do face multiple issues and the developers would need to see some prints. So here we are using console, a serial terminal, which is integrated to our development environment to see the various messages that are coming while MCU and the wireless stack communicates. Let's take the example of what kind of issues uh, we can face when we are developing a wireless application. When we connect a station or client to an access point. First, we the client scans the access point which are nearby by sending a probe request. The APs will reply 
using a probe response. Once we find our desired AP, we initiate the authentication request and then there will be authentication response. Afterwards, there will be association request and association response. So the access point can be in different security mode or open. So once this, uh, these exchanges are done, there will be the data exchange between client and access point. So suppose there is a, uh, uh, there can be different issues like, uh, let's say station is not able to scan the access point. Maybe it's far or there are too much traffic. In that case, the serial console which we have seen in previous slide will give the error, for example, scan field or somebody can provide a wrong password or can set a different security mode. In that case, one of these exchanges will fail and will get a joint fail. <clears throat> so the console log gives the good understanding where exactly the issue is. Sometimes when we are debugging such connectivity issues, we would also need to capture the wireless sniffer. The wireless logs are helpful to know the exchanges that are happening between a station and access point or between two BLE devices. If you want to capture the sniffer log, we would need a special hardware or a network adapter that supports Wireshark or OmniPeak or any other sniffing tool. As you can see here, there is a packet capture example using a Wireshark. So if we are using a sniffer hardware, we can see all the wireless exchanges as well. If not, we can only see the TCP IP exchanges in the Wireshark. Similarly, here is the example of BLE packet capture taken using a BLE sniffer. So these sniffers play an important role when we are debugging a complex issue related to wireless connection. For example, let's say there are different capabilities that access point uh, that access point is uh, telling while the station doesn't support them. In that case, there will be sometimes the connection failures. So these logs can provide good info what's really happening between those two devices. Here is the example of energy profiler. Some of the IDs do provide these profilers and these are very helpful when you are designing a low power embedded system or the IoT uh, product. These tools can give good understanding when the application is running where exactly we are consuming more current. And based on that, we can optimize our application further for low power applications. In this demo, we'll be using an application on a mobile phone, which is EFR Connect app, available from Silicon Labs on Play Store or App Store. In this app, there are various applications demo, for example, throughput, range, and Wi-Fi commissioning. We'll be using Wi-Fi commissioning, which means the first, the RS-96 will start BLA advertising. And in this app, we'll scan that BLE device. Once the user clicks on the device name, 
which is BLE configurator here. It makes a BLE connection and fetches all its nearby access point or router list from the module. Now user can select the desired SSID or AP and connect to it by entering the password if it's secure. Once connected, it will show a green sign here and will show the IP address which it has got. We will also run a web application which will be connected to the AWS cloud which acts like a, you know, uh, a remote user which observes the sensor information and takes the appropriate action. User needs to enter subscription topic and click on subscribe button. Then enter the publish topic and click on publish button. Note that user has to use the same topic names used in application for subscribe and publish. When user clicks on publish button, RS-906 wireless module fetches the temperature value read by temperature sensor on EFR32 and updates it on AWS Cloud via MQTT. I have launched the Simplicity Studio and this brings us to the welcome screen. On the welcome screen, we get the option to connect the devices. I have connected my EFR kit using USB cable to the same PC. I'll click on start and this brings us on the page where you get all the information about this kit. Apart from that, you also get the option to see example projects and demos that are available for this kit, documentation and compatible tools. Let's go to the resources where we see the project. Here we see the main file and the AWS configuration, BLE configuration and WLAN configuration. Let's go to the WLAN app dots. Here we can see the certificates that are being loaded to connect to the AWS cloud and two topics, the topic to subscribe and another topic to publish. Under BLE app.c, we have the BLE app device name where we name our device. BLE configurator here. This is the name that we'll see in the EFR Connect app on our iOS or Android mobile. Let's build the project. Once the build is done, we'll either run or debug the project. We will also use the console option so let's launch the console we'll use serial one this console is used to see the debug prints these debug prints are very helpful when we are debugging some complex projects to see the various errors, codes and all. Now we can start our debug.
once the program is flashed to the kit, it goes to the main. The main function, we do the trigger driver in it. So let's run the project. Once we run, we can see device initialization and wireless initialization and set certificate success. And now the device is doing the BLE advertisement. Let's look at the iOS side, EFI connect app. I'm mirroring my iPhone screen here. Let's launch the EFI connect app, go to Wi-Fi commissioning, you will see the BLE configurator here. Select it to make the connection. Once the connection is done, it gives us the list of access points as we can see. Now we'll select our desired access point and I will enter the password. As we can see, the connection is success. So the device is connected to the AP and it will fetch the IP address as we can see here on the screen and the MAC address. Once the IP address is done, it's showing the AWS connection and goes to the power save. After going to power save, it starts taking the temperature reading from the temperature sensor, which is available on the same kit. Now we'll launch the MQTT web app using the Node.js. This brings us to this uh, app. There are two options, subscribe topic and publish topic. Let's enter the topic, temperature underscore reading. And subscribe to it. And the published topic, which is device underscore status. And hit publish. Once we do that, you can see that this cloud is getting the temperature information. And when we enter get temperature and publish, the same message can be seen get temperature and it will give us We can see on the console, the same messages that we publish. Here is another example of IoT multi-protocol demo. As you can see, we can use the same 
a code that we have used previously and here is the same setup except there is a relay module added so based on the information that the sensor is given from the cloud the user can give an input to control some devices as we can see once the user says to switch on or off the bulb the relay will act accordingly and that's how we can see that a sensor sends the information and there is an actuator that functions based on the input given or the logic that runs on the cloud or at the edge node. Here is the block diagram. As you can see, we have EFM or EFR32 connected with RS-906 voice connect. So this is the MCU plus radio module connected to the cloud and there is a user application or the user intelligence here the processor is connected to a relay module using the gpios and that is connected to an external ac component which is connected to the ac supply so based on the user input that is received from the cloud the appropriate action will be taken here and the control signal will be sent out and relay will switch on or off that particular device similar logic can be used to control different kind of signals and take different actions let's have a look on some more offerings that are available on the web one of them is nodrid nodrid is a flow based development tool for visual programming wiring together hardware devices apis and online services as part of the iot it's easy to see messages on a topic and have a visual idea about various nodes connecting to each other for example you create a switch and connect it to a smart plug. Now we add a button or a switch and makes the logic for on and off. So when some user makes it on and off, that information will go to the device which is connected. Let's have a look for the same demo. Here is another interesting tool that is available on the web, IFTTT, as the name says, if this then that. IFTTT is a private commercial company that provides the software which allows the user to program a response to event in the world. You can define any condition and when that is met, it triggers an action. For example, in previous demo, we saw temperature data is sent. Let's say we put a threshold that if temperature is greater than certain value, notify users with SMS or email or over a phone call.
Here is the screenshot of various applets that IFTTT provides. They are very useful and some of them are very easy to use. We can use some of the applets that were shown in the previous slide. For example, you can use Alexa to give a voice command to turn on a bulb remotely and at the same time get the status back. We will see the demo. You will find it very interesting when you will use this service that a device is sending you an email or an SMS. This is called Internet of Things. When things are communicating with each other and with users via email or SMS based on the conditions. Let's have a look at the demo how it works. As you can see we are switching it on from IFTTT and you get a call your smart plug was switched on at October 6, 2021 at 1.56 p.m. And this completes the another demonstration of using IoT. It's really an informative session, Tarun. So we have a couple of questions here. Uh, so uh, IoT means uh, security is the key uh, because so much of data will transfer between the devices. So in your perspective, uh, what is the challenge over there? Um, main challenge is, you know, uh, uh, user can hack uh, any edge device or any node. I mean, a node is a very small thing, uh, which, you know, may not have too much security that we, you know, we can put on the server side or on the infrastructure that we set uh, in a, you know, a bigger organization. Uh, the node device can go uh, in a, a remote place or, you know, uh, a place where you do not have much control. So having a hardware and a secure software is the main challenge. And that's what uh, uh, the most uh, companies are now trying to uh, uh, address. Okay. And another question we have, uh, like, uh, uh, what are the challenges uh, for this IoT technology to emerge into each and every home in uh, everywhere in the world? So what are the challenges I IoT technology will be having in the future? Right. So... Uh, I would say there are, uh, uh, I mean, uh, a variety of uh, wireless protocols. So, you know, deciding what kind of protocol will suit what application, you know, optimizing the power and then uh, the cost would be the another factor. So these are the challenges that uh, would be there. And another main thing that's coming is the interoperability now. You know, uh, you can have a wireless access point and there are thousands of uh, access points out there. So your station should be compatible to that. So uh, there are a lot of certifications comes into the place that, you know, you need to certify your device for different regulatory. So these are the challenges uh, once are taken care, uh, you know, every house will have multiple sensors uh, soon and the IoT devices. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tarun. It's really informative and uh, yeah, um, it's a pleasure to have you on VLSID yeah, conference. Thank, thank you. you. My, my pleasure.